Good morning folks, or good afternoon folks I should say, it's two o'clock, uh, two o'clock where I am anyway and welcome to the Search Press Virtual Spring Festival and I'm going to do a little demo for you today. It's uh, a suitably spring subject, although I have to confess it's not very spring like outside here in Belfast, it's quite a cool and cloudy day but um, we'll carry on anyway. The, the source I'm using for this actually, uh, it's it's the Bluebell wood, but uh, there's no Bluebells. I'll show you what, I, what I'm using. This is the this is the, the photograph that I'm basing it on. And I'm just going to add some Bluebells to it because it's the easiest, easiest thing, easiest way to do it. Now, if we have a look at a, an actual Bluebell wood uh, just for a second, you can see the Bluebells there. And we know that's blue. We know they're Bluebells, but... If you really look at them, they're just blue and well, bluish. There's all sorts of different shades, blues and purples and things. And there's just the blues and purples. There's not really any specific detail. Now, I'm, I actually have a few bluebells in, in, at the bottom of my garden, which probably shows you how uncultivated my garden is. But if we have a little look at, at that, and just get the right button here, um, that's obviously what a bluebell looks like. But even with that comparative close up of a bluebell, if you look at it, we're not really seeing that many individual bells because what, ha what happens is that they all join together. And so what we get are these patches of colour. So I think where a lot of people make a mistake is with the trying to paint a bluebell wood, they think of them as bluebells, which of course that's what they are. But try too hard at painting individual flowers instead of trying to paint the effect and that's what I'm going to try to do today so we'll, we'll switch over to the to the subject I've got this drawn out we don't have a huge amount of time today so um, uh, hopefully you'll be able to you'll be able to watch this afterwards anyway but this is the, the I've added a few extra trees this is based on the on the subject that that you, you saw earlier and um, I've added a couple of extra trees. I've kept this little style. It's not really a style, but it's that sort of thing. And I'm going to just add some few bluebells in the distance and some a little bit up close. So I'm going to begin with, as I always do, with an all over wash. And if we switch on to the palette here, uh, the opposite of the bluebell colour on the colour wheel is going to be sort of something ranging between yellow towards orange. So if I can get that colour in, um, that's going to help to give me a sort of brighter, stronger uh, sky effect type of thing. And so instead of using blue for the sky, which might sort of be the obvious thing, what I'm going to do, because I don't want blue sky and blue blue bluebells, so I'm going to use this sort of warm tone in the sky. And the best thing for that is just a touch of burnt sienna, just quite quite weak, just enough to give a little bit of colour, not much more than that. I'll give a little spray to my paper just before I begin. And we'll get started. So this little wash, I'm just going to throw it on. You can see how it just lightens things up a little bit. We'll get a little bit more colour. There's a touch of Indian red. It's not darker yellow there just to give it a slightly different shade as I work my way down and then when I get to this area here we're sort of down at the point where the distant field starts so uh, for that I'll just uh, add a little bit just a touch of thallow to that thallow blue green shade I'll need to add a little bit more yellow so that's some of my quinacridone gold and uh, we can get a little bit of that on. As you can see, everything just runs together. So there's trees up there, distant trees up there as well. And then at this point, I want to introduce some of my bluebell colours. And this is the, really the first stage in trying to create the, the effect. Now, what colours do I use? Well, I can suggest a couple. Ultramarine on its own is actually probably a little bit too blue, but a touch of white in it really gives a very nice effect. So we'll get a little bit of that. And again, I'm just going to just brush that in. And then I'm going to change that slightly with a little bit of quinacridone magenta. 
So that will give us the, the uh, slightly more purple shade that you will often see as well. And I'll drop that in too. So these will just all, basically just all run together. And we'll maybe get some brighter colour in too. So perhaps some stronger ultramarine. There we go. And again, just drop that in. Now I want some green in here as well because we don't just have uh, bluebells on mass. Well, bluebells on mass, but there's lots of green in there too. So again, that phthalo blue and a touch of of the uh, quinacridone gold. There we go. I don't want it to get too cold. And I just a little bit of that in too. So I'm just dropping that in. Notice I'm not going up very far because if I start going up and dropping things in, I run the risk of getting uh, our old friend cauliflowers. Back to this, a little bit more of the blue. And down at the bottom here, I'd like to get some stronger blue. So again, I've managed to sort of mix this up with all sorts of things, but we'll get a bit of the blue and some of the quinacridone magenta and again just drop that in and bring that down to the bottom now the paper I'm using today is Milford from St Cuthbert's Mill and uh, it produces a really it blends very nicely which is the reason I'm using that today but any any good watercolour paper will will do the job so that's that stage done and uh, I just need to let that dry just uh, when well, I'm having a look and I don't see any any questions or anything there yet so um, just I just need to let that dry because obviously if I go into that again without letting it dry I'm going to get the paint spreading and from the next stage on is, is when I want to start to create the actual structure of the painting. So that's given me the background and you can see already, hopefully, that that little sort of smudgy varying of colour is enough to give an initial impression of the Bluebell Wood. And that is really what we are looking at. We're looking at impressions. I'll just dry some of these big drips away. Um, all painting really is, is to do with impression. No matter how detailed a painter you might be, at the end of the day, you're creating the illusion of something. We're, we're not creating anything real. It's, it's an illusion. And what I'm trying to do today is to create the illusion of the bluebells without actually having to paint anything terribly strong uh, with the bluebells. How are we doing with this? Still a little bit damp, so I don't. I want it to be completely dry here. So I'm just going to use the the uh, hair dryer. So apologies for the noise. I think the sky part and this area up here is quite dry now. It's still a little bit damp, but I don't want to uh, keep that noise on for too long. So next stage is going to be the, the trees at the very background distance. So for that, I'm going to change my uh, brush to uh, size 14. This is a, a Rosemary & Co. Series 402 size 14. And it has a nice point. So for most of the rest of the painting, I'll be able to use use this brush. So we'll go back to, uh, no we'll not go back to me, we'll go back to the palette and we'll get some background colour. So what do I want for these background trees? Well the background trees are literally in the background so I don't want them to be coming forward with warm colours. So I'm going to use a, a greenish brownish colour based on cobalt blue. So a little bit of quinacridone gold in that. And that gives me quite a cool green that should work quite well for background. So let's just uh, let's just see. Actually, maybe a little bit too strong. A lot of the trees are still not out in leaf yet, and uh, so therefore, 
I don't want it to get too um, too colourful in terms of the green because a lot of green would suggest uh, a lot of leaves out and um, I'm not sure about where you are but over here in Ireland a lot of the trees are still quite quite bare so we'll get more of a grey now so that's more ultramarine and burnt sienna using the side of the brush just to give me that little broken edge for my background trees but also I want to do some softening and for the softening I'm going to use this old uh, sable brush here just wet the brush slightly dry it and just sort of rub it over the edge there and that will just soften that edge a little bit and the advantage of the softer edge is that it'll sit back so that's really what I want it to do I want things to sit back a little bit more cobalt don't mind this being really quite blue drop a little bit of that when I use a different color there I like to drop it in a little bit over there too Notice I'm not, these are trees, but if you notice I'm not actually painting any trees. These are all just little marks. I'm just dipping into different colours that I have in my palette. Again, we'll get some softening of that upper edge. And then we'll bring that down. Bring this down. Again, I'm just dipping into the random colours that are there. And we'll bring that down to the edge of the field. Okay. Now, one thing I will do just before I continue is I'll get a little bit of kitchen roll. And I will just, just lift out a little line of colour there. And only because I want to make that a, I thought it might be nice to have a silver birch tree in there. Now why did I not just paint round it? Well two reasons. First of all I forgot to. Uh, but secondly, actually lifting it out like this in some ways is better because it doesn't give such an abrupt uh, edge to the tree and sometimes that can be helpful. Very often it's it's a hard, hard edge is something that's not necessarily desirable, particularly in the early stages of a painting. So with the edges there, I've I've got pretty much all soft edges. I've even softened these edges here. I've got a few little gaps in the trees, but, but that's okay. And I've kept these, as I say, quite a, a cool colour. Now what I want to do is just go over that and just make sure I've got that reasonably smooth because that's the difference between our distant trees and our field and so therefore I want that to be relatively well in fact I want it to be hard edge but anytime I say I want something to be a hard edge what I really mean is I want it to be a hard edge mostly so what I'm going to do here is again just with my softening brush keeping rinsing it just going up to the edge and just letting that edge slightly blend with the field going to be trees there now that little bit there I want to keep that pretty hard because I do want to show that there is an edge there and I think that's a good balance between soft edges here and harder edges here so I, I quite happy with that that works that works okay further down the field then I want to keep that nice tonal counter change so that's dark that's light so I'm going to keep that light you'll you'll see on the on the uh, subject that I'm basing this on it is quite light in the distant part of the field but then it gets rapidly quite dark again so I can get that effect quite easily just by rinsing my brush and just wetting the top part of the field and then if I go in with a with a, a green into that wet area so I'm go not going into the top of the wet area I'm going into the bottom of the wet area so that means it gives the green a chance to sort of go up the wet part. Whereas if I put the green in at the top of the wet area, it, the green would have nowhere to go. So I'd simply get a hard edge there. But if I go along the bottom of that damp part, you can see how you get that nice soft blend of green to the original wash from the, from the first wash. And then I want to get some bluebell colour in there. I don't want to overdo the bluebells but, but we'll get a little bit 
a little bit of bluebell colours in there. So again, the ultramarine and the quinacridone magenta. And again, I'm just going to drop that in. I want this to sort of look like, hopefully look like little sort of drifts of, of bluebells. So I'm new and I'm using these horizontal long horizontal lines because that's how we see them. We see them as bands in the distance. A little bit more green, so we'll pick up some more of that green, and then we'll bring that down to the sort of interface between that distant field and this closer area here. Okay, so that brings us down then to our foreground essentially. And again, I'll just dry up these drips. Notice all these drips, and these drips should be a sign that you're painting wet enough. If you don't have these drips, the, trust me, you're not painting wet enough. In watercolour, the paint must flow. If it doesn't flow, it sort of it has that overworked look to it. And a lot of overworking is really not down to well, some of it's down to too many brush strokes, but a lot of it's down to actually too dry paint mixture that's being scrubbed on instead of being laid on. Also want to point out at this stage, you know, if you look at this, it doesn't look like much at the minute. It's just a lot of sort of weird splashy colours. And it's important to remember that the painting won't necessarily look like a painting until quite a bit further on in the process. And again, I feel a lot of people try to make their painting look like a painting far too early. We've got to build up the background, we've got to build up the underlayers before we go for the uh, the important detailed stuff like the trees and, and perhaps some of, some of the bluebells. Okay, uh, here I want a little pathway just in there. Now at the moment I'm not entirely sure how to do that. So what I'll, what I'll do is I'll just soften that little bit there. So that sort of gives me a link between the distant field and this closer field, whereas I want to keep that little hard edge there because I want I want it to be a more distinctive uh, difference between close and distant. And now I want to get the feel of the bluebell. So I've already got some background colour but that's really um, too, too light. I might leave some of that but mostly it's too light. So we'll get some more of this uh, this colour here. Maybe a little bit more of that white in it. Might surprise some of you that I'm using white to paint with because uh, we're all warned against it. Oh, don't use white, never use white. But actually a lot of paints do have white in them. And if you happen to have a tube of any paint that's called uh, lavender or lilac or anything like that, if you have a look at the label, you'll see it contains white. So let's see. Again, I want to try to get this little idea of the drifts. Now I'm just thinking about this interface there. I'm not exactly sure what to do. So Generally, if I'm not sure what to do, I honestly just let them to let them blend. And I was saying I wanted a distinct difference, but maybe now isn't the time to get that distinct difference. So I'll I'll uh, I'll think about that later. I'll not think about that, and I'll think about that later. And I want to get the feeling of the uh, bluebell sort of interspersed with with green. So again, uh, some. I'm using the, the thallo blue green shade and the quinacridone gold mainly because I think my quinacridone gold's got a little bit dirty and therefore the extra coolness of the thallo blue green shade just helps to to make it a bit greener because I want this lovely strong green contrast against my uh, bluebell color now I will vary that so a little little bit more of the of the quinacridone gold in there will give me a much warmer green in fact, I'll use two brushes for this. I'll use one brush for the green. I'll use this smaller brush for my blues. So again, back end of the blue. Letting this all run. So I'm really doing the same thing as I did first time round, but I'm leaving a few gaps here and there because I don't want to lose all that nice light that I created on that first wash. What I'll do is I'll just allow some of those edges just to soften into light. 
And then as we get further down the paper, of course, what's happening is we're getting closer and closer to where where I was standing when I took the photograph. And so therefore, the instead of the lines of bluebells being all these little, little long strokes, they start to become a little bit more obvious. And again, if you think about that, there's a difference between looking out at the bluebells and looking down at the bluebells, which effectively is what we're going to be doing here. So I want to just make sure I get this a little bit more varied. So again, with those two colours I've been using the whole time, that's the ultramarine and the quinacridone uh, magenta. And I'm just dropping these in fairly uh, roughly and almost carelessly. Now it's not careless, I'm not just, dro I'm dropping them in and sort of seeing what I, for instance, that, that mark there doesn't, I don't, doesn't look right to me. These marks are fine. I don't like the look of that. So what do I do? Well, I'll add a little bit more green in there and that will just break up that mark a little bit. There I go. Fine. Sorted. And here again, some little marks. Now notice I haven't been thinking yet about the actual structure of bluebells. These are all just colours. And at the moment, I'm quite happy enough just with the vague sort of areas of bluebells rather than anything very specific. So I'm just alternating the brushes between, let's get a bit more light in there, I think, quite like a little bit of light here. So what I'm doing is just softening those edges so that we get um, some of that original light retained in this area. So I don't really want much in the way of hard edges just yet. Just mixing up my brushes there. Let's see, a bit more blue. Perhaps a little more of the two colours again. can even do a little bit of splatter here and I'll be doing some of this later but this just helps to start the business of suggesting these closer blooms and it's quite good fun as well so we'll get some some uh, blue splatter and then what I'll do with my greens so go back just pick up again some more of that green and sort of get some little streaks like this because the bluebells of course have got these uh, spear, spear shaped leaves. Again, don't want to do too much. It's so easy to overdo this. Very easy to overdo this. So I just want to get the beginnings of a feel for that uh, underlying undergrowth. And bluebells. There we go. I think that'll do. That'll do for that section. So I started at the top and worked down. For the second stage, I went back up and I worked down. And for the third stage, I'm going to do exactly the same thing. I don't need to touch the sky. It was the first wash. I don't need to touch the background trees. That was the second wash. But I do want to get some slightly closer trees in. And for the slightly closer trees, again, a greyish colour will do me. So ultramarine and burnt sienna is always a good safe grey and I can easily add a little bit more of the ultramarine to make it slightly blue. There we go. And then in the background here, I just want, let's just see how strong, it's maybe a bit too strong, I'll add a touch more water to it. So it's very hard to tell whether, whether the strength of something is right or not and then with the little branches it'll be quicker and simpler to do this with my sword liner that's the sword liner the little uh, long pointy brush maybe see this a little bit better if I use a use a different camera So 
So little jerky movements is really what all I do with the with the sword liner. And this is to allow me to create the, again illusions. We're talking illusions. Now there's two trees quite close together. What I wouldn't want to do is put another one in that was that would give me three equally spaced trees. So perhaps I could put one in leaning slightly, maybe leaning slightly the other way. And again, lots of little side, well, I say lots of little side branches. Actually, you don't want to do anywhere near the amount of branches that the tree would actually have. It would look far, far too cluttered if we did everything. And a lot of the trees, as I was saying, still really don't have any, don't have any leaves on them. Bring something out there and that's going to go behind this big foreground tree. So just little simple marks. And we can vary the height of the trees and make some smaller, some larger. Lower branches are always useful because the lower branches can give us a lot of connections. Just dry it up to stop it causing any mischief. And remember branches go, depending on the tree, branches go in all sorts of different directions. They don't just go out and they go up and they go down. No, that's not too bad, but I'm going to get my larger brush here and I'm just going to sort of try to get a little bit of a little bit of undergrowth going on here. And this will give me back. I was saying about losing my edge so I can get the edge back with that. Between the uh, foreground and the and the middle distance. So that simple effect of joining the trees together gives connections. It creates one great big mass of trees rather than five or six separate trees. So when I do it like that, at first glance, you shouldn't really be necessarily completely aware of how many trees there are. A little bit of cobalt in that and I'll just use that just to give me some slightly more distant ones because I want to make definitely want to make this a woodland. So we'll just go a slightly different colour and slightly weaker. Now this section here I'm going to leave that quite blank, but we'll get a couple more trees just maybe coming over from the over from the left. And you can see how quick I can do these trees with that sword liner brush. It really is a, a very useful brush. And don't be afraid to allow, let the trees cross over. That's important in creating creating the linkages. Let's see what another one there maybe. Do, do, do. It's not too bad. A little bit more then of the same colour on my uh, larger brush. And again, we'll bring this down to create the lower edge. I'm just using a little sort of jiggly jiggly sort of shape just to just to hint that there's rough ground there that it's not a completely smooth edge All right Oh yeah just so that I don't just have that slightly less interesting area we can get some 
little saplings or something coming out of here. I notice I've covered up a lot of the the uh, bluebells in that background field. That's okay. That's okay. Remember, you don't need to have them really, really obvious. That you can. You, it's much better to be slightly subtle with these things. Okay. Now I dry up all the drips. So using my uh, lifting out brush is also my soaking up brush and all sorts of things. Lifting out brush, softening brush, soaking up brush. Yeah, everything. There we go. So that just allows that to dry. Actually, while I'm just thinking while that is still wet, I think I'll introduce my my fence. There's a few little fence posts here. So and the reason I want to do this while this is still wet. Is because where it, where the fences meet this vegetation, obviously what will happen is it will go slightly soft, which is sort of what I want because then the fence will disappear into the vegetation. And that that's it's just enough to just give give a little bit of variety. So then let that dry back down here to my bluebells. Now you may sort of think why, why spend all this time going back and going back and going back? Surely we should be painting with as few layers as possible. And yes that's true to a certain extent but it's it's also important that we don't um, sort of lose the the what am I trying to say here? It's important that, that we don't overdo things. And this is the easiest way of not overdoing things. Always leave it wanting more, really. And then at the end of the painting, hopefully a couple of little marks are all that are needed to uh, add a little bit more to it. Okay, back down here. Now this is where I'm wanting to get some a little bit more specific not detail, I'm sort of searching for the word here, but a little bit more obvious suggestion of the of the bluebells. Dipped into the wrong thing there. Blue and magenta. And to get this, I want to start the process of suggesting some of these distant little, little bluebells. Now, what am I going to do? Well, you can see I'm, I'm just making sort of random little marks and then I'm going to take my softening brush and I'm going to soften at least some of them. Leave others slightly hard edged so that we get the beginnings of a little bit of something happening in the distance really is what I'm after. And the big benefit of working this way, where I do a little bit and then leave it and then do a little bit more, is that it means at the minute I can sort of say with complete honesty, I'm not entirely sure what I'm doing. So therefore, by only by not overdoing it, it means that I can I can uh, come back to it later and, and get a little bit more. more uh, hopefully I'll come back to it with a better idea of what I'm trying to to do but all I'm trying to do at this very moment is try to get the start of a hint of the blooms. Now let me see that's that's uh, that's sort of okay but we'll just move that out of the way. We will maybe try some splatter again. Well in doubt. The, the benefit of splatter incidentally is simply that because the paint goes on so randomly you're never quite sure what you're going to get so it never looks contrived. So again a few little, little bits of splatter. Something like that. Not entirely sure whether that's completely successful but you don't need to worry too much. And a little bit more of our 
of our purpley color. And then we'll change that color a little bit. So perhaps um, a little bit more of the magenta in it. Now it looks quite magenta, but uh, trust me, I was studying them carefully this morning. There were all sorts of colors in the bluebells. And to be honest, most of them, it was a lot more magenta than, than blue. Another way, if, if you do too much, let me just deliberately do too, too many little individual strokes. A good way to, to fix that is just with a quick spray. So if I just give that a little spray, if I could just do that with everything because I'm still not entirely sure. You can see how the spray just causes them all to uh, run a little bit and blend a little bit. And that all helps the illusion, right? A little bit more blue. See, I'm, I know I've said about the magenta, but let's be honest, they are bluebells, so we want to get some blue in there too. So again, just using that tip of the brush just to try to get, again, some marks. I haven't painted bluebells yet. I haven't painted any obvious bells, and I probably won't. Instead, it's just trying to get the illusion of it. Now, down at the front, we perhaps can. Now, if I remind you what the... Um, what the bluebells look like. They're, they're hanging, you see how purple they are actually? You're, you're, they're hanging down like that. And they're not, you, you don't see too many individual blooms. So that's what you need to be a little bit careful about. That You know, I don't do too many sort of things like this, little marks like this, but there's no doubt about it. It's, it's actually quite good fun to do that. So I'll probably not be able to stop myself, but the Bells do hang down, so of course, if they hang down, at least make the marks hang down or make the marks move in that direction. I'm possibly starting in with this much too early, but it, but I've sort of, we'll call it a little treat, because with all the um. With all these vague marks, eventually there is a, a desire to get something a little bit more definite. But again, nothing too much. In fact, I'll leave that. So we've now gone sort of, what's that, three layers. And I'll just, there's a few blobs here and there. And I'll dry that quickly with the dryer. And next stage will be the bigger, closer trees. You're all enjoying this at home, folks. It's it's a it's a strange situation these these uh, live streaming things because of course I'm here on my own and I don't hear anything back from you. But I, I've got your comments in front of me and I'm reading those when I get a, a chance just to to look up. So it looks as if you're you're uh, you're enjoying things. Okay, so that's that's good. Big trees. This is where I want to start getting some tonally strong colors and I want to get it really. Uh, some good strong darks because the strong darks of course will set off the lights of the flowers so I'll maybe just do a couple of trees maybe do three we'll do this silver birch and we'll do uh, one there and maybe another one there so just to offset it a little bit it's always a good idea I think not to not to have things too balanced so if we go back to the palette I want to get a, a decent dark here so again the ultramarine and the burnt sienna and let's see we'll start over here so where we'll have this tree i'll have this tree coming from here the light is coming from the right so therefore the darker part of the tree would be on the left so let's just get a big dark line up there that may seem a little bit mm, uncouth looking but if i take my little damp brush and just run it down the side there. Then that will give me 
some light now what I do want to try to do is just lift out a little bit of the previous color that I had on so I'm just scrubbing a little bit and then taking an almost dry brush just to lift that off so you're, you're getting a little bit of light there do the same thing here Now, with that same mix, I just want to bring that across. Still a little bit damp to do that with. Okay, we'll leave that for a moment or two. I'll pick up the sword liner again. Same mix. And we'll start to create some of the bigger branches. So I can just be a little bit bolder with the sword liner now because I'm not producing little fine branches I'm wanting to produce something with a little bit more substance over here again branches from the side are going to be separated from that dark area a little bit bring that right across so that we get the trees the trees from both sides will link together Right, I'm not sure that's maybe convincing as a, a light side to the tree. Uh, so there's not a huge amount I can do. I can do a little. I'll show you what, what can be done, but it just needs to dry a little bit first. So while that's drying, I think I can leave that now. That's okay. And we can go over to the other side. We've got a, a silver birch tree there. And what, what's so special about a silver birch? Well, it's just because the bark is light. So it, it just gives me a chance to do something a little bit different. And so, you know, the silver birch is the white bark and the silver bark. And then it has the little uh, darker bark areas sort of coming around from the dark side of the tree. Let me just work my way up there. Nice. One thing I will have to do, I've got some of the background tree branches overlapping that, which clearly could not be the case. So I just, I will need to just take those out, which I can do with a little bit of a, little bit of a rub. So now those branches from here are going behind the tree. Anywhere where I've got those passing in front, I'll just lift that out. Now, how can we get um, the tree to look light on that right hand side? Because at the minute it sort of doesn't really. Well, it's fairly simple. All we do is darken the other side of the trunk. So if I go back in here and just Darken that slightly. You can see how the how the uh, lightness of that bark then suddenly appears. So what what can this be? Well, this can just be some more some more undergrowth. What I do need to do, but is make sure that it also appears on the other side. So in other words, you can't just have undergrowth or more vegetation appearing on one side of the tree. It has to pass by and reappear on the other side so get a little bit darker in there it's where I feel I can afford to go a little bit stronger and then we'll sort of disguise that as some sort of uh, shrubby shrubby vegetation And of course, on the silver birch, I'll get some branches coming out the side of it. Now, the branches, of course, would also be silvery, but uh, what I'll do here is just dab the brush or dab my, my little tissue on some of them, just let some of them just sort of disappear a little bit. 
Uh, right, another tray. I'm just going to do a very simple one because time's running out a little bit. So we'll just do a little sort of spindly tree just up the middle of those two. And another way I can create the light and dark is that that all looks quite dark. But if I further darken the left side. So if I get some of the ultramarine burnt sienna, quite a stiff, almost sticky mix, mix and just run that down the left side. That will just drift across very slightly and should give us a reasonable suggestion of the tree. And if I feel it needs more, I can just down a little bit more. I can just lighten up the right hand side. So just run my brush just down there and just lighten that up a little bit. But again, I run into the difficulty of having to lift a little bit of light out from the background greens, which isn't difficult to do. Side branches. Again with the side, I, I don't really, th I mean, I'm calling that a silver birch, but to be perfectly honest, it just is a tree that happens to have a light bark instead of a dark bark. And these other ones are just trees. <laughs> uh, if you start going down the route of trying to be specific about the type of tree it is, first of all, you have to ask yourself, is that really important? Well, if it's important to you, then yes, it's important, but it's not important from the terms of the painting. bit there and then from the bottom of these trees particularly if they're in forests you will always get little sort of sprouts coming out on the side of that of my uh, silver birch I'm just going to use an even smaller brush this is a size four and plenty of paint very little water which is the opposite to what I was doing earlier when I was using plenty of paint and plenty of water. Get that a little bit browner so it's really sticky. That's sticky enough that I can paint my my palette with it. And it, I just want to to get just taking some of the paint off. I want to try to get a really broken that's better. Really sort of broken edge there. Just to help us with that birch tree. I'm not sure whether that's worked ideally, but it will do. And while I've got some of that dark, I'll just add a little bit more uh, blue to it. Oh, it's too dry. Just to give me the little bits of wire. let that disappear in there we go in here we'll get that a little bit varied it is quite dark actually but I'm get it a little bit darker to the left a little bit darker underneath a little bit darker over to the left there. This is probably a bit light, but that's okay. We'll get a little bit of the green that was still in my palette there. I'll allow that just to sort of blend in with the bottom of the of the post, just so that it doesn't abruptly stop really. And then with a little bit more of that green, let's, let's just get a few little touches just to uh, creating the path really by by sort of adding some grass on everywhere other than the path. Once more, we need to be careful. It's so easy to overdo. Uh, 
And what I'll do is I'll try to, uh, I, probably another five minutes will do this. So I'll give, give us a couple of minutes just if anybody has any questions, if you want to put them in the comments. And when we're done with this, I will uh, have a little look and see if anyone needs any further information on anything. Now, obviously, when I'm putting this green and I'm trying to avoid my my purples and blues to a large extent, because obviously uh, the more I cover my purples and blues, the, the more I lose the the, the blue bells, which is really the, the subject. So I, if you notice what I'm doing here is going in with my greens in places where it's already green or I'm overlapping the blue slightly, but not very much. Now the stalks for the for the bluebells are really quite substantial. They're quite big things. Uh, we'll just get more green here a little second. And I want to get perhaps a bit more at the front here. So there's a, a sort of blue. Oh, that's a bit horrible, that colour. Let's try a bit more yellow in it. And there we go. So anywhere where I'm sort of where I've got a little suggestion of the of the sort of bluebell shape, there's another one there. I'll get a little stalk coming up, and then where I don't do any bluebells at the moment, uh, or any obvious ones, I can obviously add some as well. So I could do a little stalk there, and then I'll add a couple of bluebell tops to it or something. Let that break up too because we don't want breaking things up is so useful because if we just do the f you never see the full stock because there's going to be another stock crossing over or something you you will never see when you look at a whole lot of anything you will never see any individual really in its entirety or certainly it's pretty unlikely so when I'm doing these leaves and these stalks I'm I'm allowing them to break up so that we we don't have too many uh, in other words what i don't want is is you know too much of this you know if i do that that's far far too obvious so what i'm trying to do is that but not make it not make it so obvious that's probably all right let's see a little bit more then of my bluebell color so same mix the uh, ultramarine and the magenta and where I've got a few of these, I'll just sort of put a little put a little hat on them as such. And what I like to do is I'll do some with that color, which is uh, the mixture of blue and uh, magenta. And then what I'll also do is use a couple of different colors so let me just use the blue more or less on its own and just intersperse some of the purples with the blues because you will very often find that even on the same flower you get you get lots of color now then splatter again back to this idea of splatter so let's get three different splatters we'll get a sort of bluish one brush is a little bit small for that i'll move up to the size seven now again as i was saying this random these random splashes of color just help to sort of give a link between the, the more, shall we say, carefully drawn flowers, not that there's many of them, and the sort of just the bands of colour behind. So by aiming the splatter here, some of it actually goes here, in fact some goes up there, but it it just helps to, to create the variety. So that was blue, back in, and we'll get a little magenta in that do the same thing so again I, I like working in three so I use three tones light medium and dark I use three colors so I've got my blue now this is more my magenta now you pr probably I have to be honest I'm not sure that I would even myself be able to tell the difference there but anyway and then we'll get some of the white in it 
maybe a bit more blue. And this just gives a slightly different effect. And of course the white can go, or with the white in it, it becomes slightly opaque. And so therefore it uh, will cover, to a certain extent, it will cover some of the darker areas of the background. If you need it to really cover some of the dark areas, it needs to have lots of white. So you would need sort of strong white and then maybe a little bit of the blue. And with that very strong mix, probably we could cover. You can see how that is much stronger. So any, any really dark areas, I'll get a little bit of that lighter stuff in. And so it's nearly done. Just one last little bit of warmth. I just want to get a little bit of warmth in it. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, clean out one section of my palette here just so that you can see what I'm doing and then I'll get some warm colour. So a little bit of the burnt sienna and the Indian yellow and I can dilute that quite a lot and I just want this just to give me a little touch of warmth. And it's just enough to just create a little bit of sunshine. And with that colour, we'll just get a little bit more on it here. Again, just a little bit of light for some sunshine. Then we'll get some shadow as well. So I'll just make that slightly, slightly purpley. I'm just using sort of whatever's here, really. And we'll just bring that across. Again, try and uneven because the shadow's being cast over uneven ground and then it would be slightly smoother ground and then it would be uneven again. There's not a great deal of shadow really, but um, the shadow sometimes can help. So a little bit of darker shadow in there just. And I think that's pretty much as much as we need to do. As you know, you can always keep going. And that very often is a problem. It's so easy to keep going in a painting when really we should be stopping and thinking at least. So I haven't had a lot of time to think there really. But um, the overall effect, I think, if you ask someone to guess what that was, I would like to hope that they would say it was a bluebell wood. There we go. Now I'll have, I'll have to move away slightly so that I can read the comments, see if there's any questions. Uh, ah yes, well Janice, as you see I did add some shadow. Although I have to be honest, I nearly forgot to. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see, oh that's good, there's not too many, not too many questions that I have to answer there. Excellent. Well, um, yeah, the thing about a couple of people have asked about the amount of detail, and that's always a tricky thing, just how much detail do we put in? And the answer is it's it's impossible to it's impossible to to be sure or exact about how much detail to put in. I don't like putting in too much detail. I like this idea of illusion and creating the the uh, suggestion of something rather than, than being terribly precise. That's just me. It doesn't mean if you like doing a lot of detail, that doesn't mean that you're wrong in doing that. It just means that we're all different and we're all different painters. So you should always do what what you like to do. But anyway, that's the, 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 the end of the painting. That's the final painting. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, this little demo. Uh, if you I'm sure Monica's already mentioned it, but I've got three books with Search Press, uh, one on street scenes, one on watercolour landscapes, and one on snow scenes, which probably is be, uh, probably best to wait for next year for that one. But the, all three are available. And I'm sure you, you'll know that I've, my website's got lots of stuff to, to look at and uh, my YouTube channel and things like that. So um, 
I hope you've enjoyed this and it's been lovely to have you with me. Thank you all for taking the time to join me because it's, it's time out of your weekend so I do appreciate it a lot. Thank you very much and enjoy your painting.